All right, it is six on the nose by my watch. So I'm gonna get started. Just a reminder that we are recording this session. So to have the best recording possible, we're gonna ask you to turn off your cameras and to turn off your mics if you're not presenting. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. So we'll just give everyone just a second to do that. And I'm gonna make my introduction as brief as I can because I know that we have a lot of stuff that we wanna to cover tonight. Um, so welcome to tonight's program. The Senator was a ham, Gary Goldwater, and amateur radio. Uh, some staff introductions right at the top. Our moderator tonight is Dr. David Turpey, Vice President of Education, Exhibits, and Publications. And then also joining us is Vanessa Fajardo. She's coming to us live from the Goldwater exhibit. Um, and she'll be helping us kind of show some of the details of the ham shack itself. And then my name is Jamie Adams. I'm the curator of education and I will just be kind of generally helpful this evening or as helpful as I can be. So a little bit about the Arizona Historical Society. We were established by an act of the first territorial legislature and we are the state's oldest historical agency with locations in Yuma, Flagstaff, Tempe, and Tucson. Our mission is connecting people through the power of Arizona's history, and we're really excited to connect with all of you tonight. I think last time I looked at our registration, we were uh, 170 strong, so that's quite a few connections we're making. Just a reminder that we have a brand new license plate. Uh, when you purchase the license plate through the DMV, you directly support the Historical Society. So, uh, you know, if you're in the market for a new vanity plate, consider this one. Also, just a reminder that our museums are open. Uh, the Arizona History Museum and in Tucson and the Arizona Heritage Center in Tempe. Plan your visit today uh, by going to azhs.org slash tickets. And a couple of exhibition highlights, uh, some new exhibitions that just opened. Uh, one is Unframed, a photo journey through the Navajo and Hopi Nations featuring the photography of Catherine McKenna. And then opening tomorrow, which is very exciting, is ready to launch Arizona's Place in Space. And that one is located here in Tucson. And while you're here taking a look at the space exhibit, consider also looking at the Barry Goldwater Ham Shack that's also open. Uh, our museums are open from 10 to 2, Tuesday to Saturday. More virtual programs are on the calendar. This is just a very small sampling of what's next, um, but our calendar is pretty booked out for the rest of the year with lots of really interesting events. So we really look forward to seeing return visitors to some of our future virtual programs. For more information on all of our virtual programs, you can visit azhs.org slash calendar. Members, ooh. I progressed way too fast, hello. Members get the best deal in Arizona history. When you become a member of the Historical Society, you support our work when we do programs like this, when we collect new objects, create new exhibitions. Uh, members get free general admission to all of our museums and a discount in the gift shop, plus a subscription to the award-winning Journal of Arizona History, which a little bit more about the journal. We actually just published our state of the field issue, which is like, it's a double issue. So there's like 400 pages in it and all of the articles are incredible. One of the upcoming talks is actually with all of the different authors from all of those journal articles. So uh, it's available now on Project Muse and you can read it online. For more information about anything that I've just covered or other things like library and archival research or educational materials, you can visit us online at azhs.org. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. David Turpey, who will introduce our special guest tonight. David? Thank you, Janie, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We're, we're very pleased to, to be able to present this uh, virtual program tonight, and we're, we're glad to have uh, all of you here uh, with us virtually. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our featured presenter tonight for this virtual program, Eric Nystrom. He is a, an associate professor at Arizona State 
Polytechnic campus, uh, where he teaches courses on US history, global history, the history of engineering and historical methods. His research focuses on the history of American engineering and technology, especially late 19th and early 20th century mining. He is the author of the book, Seeing Underground, Maps, Models, and Mining Engineer in America uh, from the University of Nevada Press. Uh, and he also uh, is a series editor um, for a, a mining history series with the University of Nevada Press. Uh, his book, Seeing Underground, won the Mining History Association's Clark C. Spence Award in 2015 uh, for the best scholarly book on mining history published in the previous two years. Uh, as a historian who studies technology, Professor Nystrom has uh, also developed a, a personal and a little bit of a scholarly interest in ham radio. So we are very pleased to have him with us here tonight to present this program in conjunction with our wonderful exhibit at the Arizona History Museum in Tucson on Barry Goldwater's ham radio shack. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Professor Nystrom. Great, thank you so much, David. Um, so give me just a moment here to uh, set up my screen sharing. Um, and uh, David, am I correct in thinking that, uh, that as people have questions, to put those in the chat and then somebody will be monitoring uh, those? Uh, as yes, well? absolutely, yeah, thank, thank you. I, I forgot to mention that. Yeah, please, please post your comments in the chat and, and we'll get to those at, at the end. Super, okay. And so uh, can I get uh, uh, David or somebody else to, to just verify that uh, everything's visible here. We've got the numbers in the lower right and we've got the red square and, and whatnot. Okay, I'm getting the thumbs up there. Um, okay, well, thank you uh, everybody very much uh, for coming tonight. Um, I've got to say, uh, I, this is the product of a, uh, a big mistake on my part. So I got into ham radio not very long ago, only about a year and a half ago, um, in part to do something through the pandemic, in part because I was looking for a hobby that had nothing to do with my work, which is being a university history professor. Um, and so with this talk today, I've clearly screwed that up. Uh, you know, but uh, I think it's a, a worthy uh, topic to, uh, to, to look at, and, and so therefore uh, it's, it's well worth it. So um, just, a, a <laughs> you know, my own uh, problem there uh, has led me to this fascinating topic. Uh, before we begin, I did want to say uh, a brief uh, word of thanks, obviously, to the Arizona Historical Society, especially David Turpey, uh, Janie Adams, uh, Vanessa Farhado, uh, and James Burns. But I also very much wanted to thank uh, a number of members of the ham community, uh, people like Bob Davies, K7BHM, uh, John Rehack, N6HI, uh, Pete Veronis, uh, NL7XM, uh, Norm Vastoletos, uh, K7NWF, uh, and Herman Landua Jr., uh, among others. Um, and in particular, I wanted to say uh, that uh, this research is not done. Um, this is a, 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 a flag on the ground, perhaps, but, uh, but there's more to know. Uh, there are sources that I haven't looked at, and there are lots of stories out there about people uh, interacting with uh, Senator Goldwater that would be great to collect. Um, and so, uh, especially for those of you hams who might have something to share with me, if you want to share it on the record, uh, I'm good on QRZ. Uh, the hams will know what that means. Uh, so uh, go ahead and, and, uh, and send me a line um, and uh, if you're willing to share uh, for the record. And if you want to share off the record, that's fine too. Just let me know. Um, but I hope that down the road, uh, this research that you're seeing for the first time tonight uh, can grow into uh, an article or, or some other kind of publication as well uh, and really preserve this history, um, you know, both with the help of the museum, but also sort of as a standalone thing. So, uh, so with that, uh, we'll get started here. Um, first, I should probably say, I, I assume most people in the audience know this, but it's worth uh, saying um, anyway, that Barry Goldwater, who, the person we're talking about, uh, he was a conservative Republican politician. Uh, he was from Arizona. He ran from, for president in 1964. Uh, he was born in Phoenix in Arizona territory uh, on New Year's Day in 1909. And he was part of a family who owned department stores in the state. So he performed dedicated military service during World War II and afterward as part of the uh, Air Force and then the Air Force Reserves. Uh, he was part of a coalition of pro-growth politics in Phoenix after the war. Uh, and then he was elected to the US Senate in 1952. In 1964, he ran for United States president on a conservative Republican ticket, and he was soundly defeated. Uh, elected to the Senate again in 1968, Goldwater served until his retirement in 1987. He remained active locally 
uh, in, but then uh, until a series of major health problems in 1996, and he passed away at the age of 89 uh, on, on uh, May 29th, 1998. So that's our capsule uh, biography. Uh, these are sufficient credentials. These, re these they really are. Uh, pioneer family, presidential candidate, 30 years in the US Senate. These are sufficient credentials to justify having some of your stuff in the state museum. Um, but in this case, look at this, this stuff here, right? You know, what is this stuff? In this case, his stuff is a desk and some radio equipment. Uh, you know, Barry Goldwater uh, was an amateur or ham radio enthusiast. It's my contention that amateur radio played an important role in Goldwater's life. And that in turn, Goldwater played an important role in the evolution of amateur radio. Both of these threads can be seen, I think, in, the, in Goldwater's radios that are on display in the museum. So in my talk today, I'd like to talk, examine these different threads of meaning uh, by looking at Goldwater's amateur radio life and looking at the impact of his work on the hobby. By doing so, I hope we can also better appreciate what it means to have uh, Goldwater's radios in a museum. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, radio in Goldwater's life. Uh, ham radio meant a, a lot, quite a lot, to Barry Goldwater. There's a substantial historiographic literature on Goldwater, which mostly concentrates on his political career and his philosophy. Not surprising, uh, you know, that's what he's known for nationally. In most of these books, Goldwater's interest in amateur radio is typically mentioned only once or twice, uh, in passing maybe, uh, as part of a discussion about the senator's hobbies. Uh, Goldwater's more autobiographical books include a bit more about his passion for radio, though frequently it's still framed as one of his hobbies. The senator goes into greater detail, and it's common for at least one radio-related uh, photograph uh, to be included. Um, reflecting on his career, Goldwater noted how his hobbies, especially flying, photography, amateur radio, uh, and tinkering with electronics, um, really, uh, quote, often caused my public and private lives to crisscross, something uh, sometimes invading and other times complementing one another, unquote. They were, quote, an easy, natural way to get to know more people and make friends, unquote. In a 1998, 1988, I'm sorry, popular biography, Goldwater described his participation in amateur radio as one of the great joys and adventures of my life because of the way that radio, quote, can be a positive force among men and women in every land, unquote. Like many other hams, Goldwater personally experienced how radio, quote, brings things, brings people together, unquote, creating, quote, a, a lifelong friendship with many thousands of people, unquote, along the, around the world with whom he had talked, but never met in person. Uh, the kind of thing that, that in, you know, the mid, uh, in the internet age maybe isn't so surprising, uh, but in the pre-internet age is very much uh, something that is, uh, you know, distinctive to the ham radio hobby. Okay. So first, let's talk a little bit about the early years of amateur radio. Uh, wireless communication was on the forefront of technology at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, in 1896, uh, Guglielmo Marconi, a young Italian Englishman, sent and received a wireless message more than two miles in England. By 1899, his equipment was able to span the English Channel, 32 miles, uh, and he had set his sights on ship-to-shore communication. These developments were widely publicized, and experimenters the world over started to tinker with wireless telegraphy, following in Marconi's footsteps. Uh, in December 1901, Marconi announced a successful attempt to transmit a signal 2,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean from Cornwall, England to Newfoundland in Canada. And so all this sparked tremendous interest in radio, and soon tinkerers were constructing their own apparatus for sending and receiving along the lines of Marconi's rigs. Uh, governments, especially the Navy, were keenly interested in the technology, and of course Marconi and his competitors wanted to make money from providing radio services, especially for shipping. They were thinking of this very much in a naval sense. Um, and, uh, and I should mention as a side note that this predates broadcast radio. Uh, no one at the time was thinking about broadcasting. Uh, they were thinking about this as wireless telegraphy, right? Telegraphy without wires. Um, but the technology of the time, which, required, which relied on sparks to create wa radio waves, was extremely inefficient. Sparks made noise across a huge swath of radio spectrum, so it was very easy for signals to interfere with each other, and those quote-unquote amateurs were suspected of being among the worst offenders. In 1912, at the urging of the Navy, Congress passed a bill to regulate radio. Uh, after much negotiation, the amateurs were actually permitted to exist. Not a trivial thing. This was uh, uh, a little bit farther forward compared with most other countries. Um, but uh, 
but they were, so this was certainly a win for the hobby, uh, but they were relegated to the seemingly useless spectrum of 200 meters and down, meaning 200 meters or less uh, in terms of wavelengths, um, which these were so high frequency that they were deemed worthless in comparison to the longer wavelengths coveted by the Navy and commercial services. Um, so amateurs made the most of this frequency allocation, and they soon discovered that HF signals could be made to go remarkable distance with surprising fidelity by skipping them off the ionosphere. Um, during World War I, amateurs were banned from either transmitting or receiving, a ban that was not lifted fully until November 1919, uh, a year after the war had concluded because of foot dragging by the Navy. Um, they had aspirations to control all radio by themselves. Uh, so amateurs were then forced to apply for a new operating license. So between 1912 and the, when uh, all amateur radio was shut down for World War I, uh, there was only one licensed amateur uh, in Arizona. This was uh, a fellow named Mead W. Powell uh, of Warren near Bisbee. Uh, once amateurs returned to the air after the war, amateur radio began to grow in Arizona as it did elsewhere. The list of licensed amateurs in 1920 uh, showed a total of six. Five had joined Powell, uh, including one amateur in Phoenix and one in Tucson, uh, with the rest in Douglas and Lowell down by Bisbee, a, a high-tech era, high-tech area of the state at that time because of the smelting and mining operations. Uh, from there, the ranks grew rapidly. There were 18 amateurs in Arizona in 1921. That became 30 in 1922. Uh, and the next two years saw continued rapid growth uh, with 36 hams in 1923 and 54 in 1924. Um, like many amateurs of his generation, Goldwater was first exposed to the exciting world of radio as a boy. His father bought him a crystal radio receiver at age 11, which he used to listen to Los Angeles area transmissions as there was no one transmitting in Phoenix. The following year, he helped Earl Nielsen, a Phoenix radio shop owner, uh, set up the first broadcasting station in Phoenix. Soon young Goldwater, who we see here at the, at the controls, uh, would have a transmitter and a license of his own, joining amateur ranks with call sign 6BPI in 1922. His first attempt used an automobile coil, uh, <laughs> borrowed in quotes, as, uh, as Goldwater later remembered, uh, from a local mechanic who soon demanded it back, um, and that coil was used to make the spark. Uh, next, young Barry moved to a rotary spark gap, uh, uh, rotary gap spark transmitter, um, and at this time, the transition this is about 1922, uh, the transition from damped waves generated by firing sparks to continuous wave or CW tones generated by vacuum tubes was underway across the hobby. Uh, Goldwater remembers sweeping floors in an auto garage, picking cotton and doing other chores to save up for vacuum tubes, which cost about a dollar a watt uh, at the time. Uh, he first managed to get a five watt tube and eventually worked his way up to a 20 watt setup. Goldwater later said that his longest confirmed contact was Sioux City, Iowa, uh, but the work was thrilling nonetheless. And here in this photo, uh, just a, an amazing photo from the time, the fact that we have this surviving. If you look at those QSL cards in the background there, we can make out a couple of them. Um, we can uh, see 6BIP, 6BUM, uh, 6UW, and something that ends in BH. Uh, 6BIP was uh, George Becker in uh, Winnemucca, Nevada. 6BUM was uh, in Ukiah, California. And 6UW was in Los Gatos, uh, California. And the BH one very well may have been his mentor uh, and friend in Phoenix, Earl Nielsen, who was six BBH. Uh, so he's getting out, you know, young, young Barry uh, getting out there on the airwaves. Um, Goldwater's early ham career was cut short, however. Uh, and I should say, here's a, a QSL card. This is an incredibly rare find. Um, and, uh, and thanks to uh, the person who allowed me to, to duplicate it here uh, in the talk today. Um, this is from late 1922, and he's uh, reporting that he heard someone 6ka um, and uh, and that the there was some interference but that he he heard them okay and he wishes them uh, a, a Merry Christmas and, and best regards um, Goldwater's early hand career was cut short though uh, in 1924 Barry Goldwater who was kind of a lousy student and sort of a, a prankster uh, was sent to military school his father sent him off to Virginia uh, licenses of the era were valid for a shorter period of time anyway and his undoubtedly expired while he was away at school once he graduated and returned to Arizona, he had other pursuits like flying and starting a family. Those occupied his time. Uh, when the war came, this is World War II, uh, Goldwater finagled his position uh, into uh, in his way into a position with the Army, a story well documented elsewhere. Uh, and among other things, he taught cadets Morse code in the early years of the war. Um, after, coming, after World War II was over in the early 1950s, 
Goldwater embarked on a political career, although he did uh, stay in the reserves and he uh, kept flying. This is a, a jet from the Arizona National Guard. It looks to me a little bit like a F-86 Sabre, but it could be, could be wrong. Um, he embarked on this political career though. Obviously images like this didn't hurt. Uh, Arizona apparently likes to uh, elect people who can fly, uh, which is kind of fun. Um, and uh, he won a seat on the city uh, council of Phoenix as part of a reform ticket in uh, 1950. Um, and then quickly getting a taste for politics, he successfully ran for the US Senate in 1952 and he was reelected uh, in 1958. There's a, a quick summary uh, of, of what he, he did there in politics. And then in the early 1960s, Goldwater was drawn back to amateur radio, and this time it stuck. Uh, through, though his license had long since expired, apparently he held a non-operating membership in the AWRL, uh, which is amateur radio's uh, major organization across the nation, uh, at least some of the intervening years. In May 1961, as a sitting senator, uh, he was invited to speak at the AWRL's Southwestern uh, Conven Division Convention in Phoenix. One party in the AWRL delegation Director Carl L. Smith knew Goldwater from their wartime service together. Uh, the AR or the AWRL then helped for his asked for his political help with uh, passing reciprocal licensing. This was apparently the hook that brought him back to the hobby. Ham radio was clearly on his mind, and it must have been a topic of discussion among Goldwater and his Washington friends. Uh, two of them who were hams, including General Curtis LeMay, the cigar-chomping head of Strategic Air Command, who Goldwater had gotten to know in Southeast Asia during World War II. Uh, they set up a complete station in Goldwater's Washington apartment when he was out of town. Uh, he came back, apparently, there was a note, don't transmit, uh, but he could at least receive. Uh, with a supervisory ham over his shoulder, Goldwater sat down at the radio. He said, quote, I sent out a CQ, and by golly, I got a guy in Miami, Florida, and I was gone, laughter. I was back then. So you could see the enthusiasm that he came, that he, with which he came back to the, the radio. So he uh, borrowed a military Morse code practice trainer and received coaching on the electronics theory component of the test. Uh, and after a bit of a struggle at first, uh, Goldwater finally applied himself. We're talking about a sitting senator, folks. He applied himself and passed the licensing exam uh, in late 1962. He received the Arizona-based call sign K7UGA, uh, a call sign we're going to hear uh, more than once uh, tonight, um, and a Washington, D.C.-based one as well, K3UIG. Uh, there's K7UGA. Uh, um, and uh, here is K3UIG. These are both QSL cards, which are used to send back and forth the equivalent of the one earlier that said 6BPI on it. Um, this newly relicensed ham quickly immersed himself in the hobby. His initial setup in Washington was limited by the vertical antenna. So within a year, he put a tri-band beam up on his apartment roof. He quickly set up a station at his Arizona home as well with a four-band beam up on a 60-foot tower. Goldwater joked about jumping back in the hobby with both feet so vigorously that his wife had gotten mad. Quote, this is the first thing that's ever kept me home, unquote. So Hams, uh, then and now, uh, there's our, our, our guy in Washington with his, with his set, uh, were discouraged from talking about politics on the air. Uh, and in a spirit of friendly camaraderie, it was traditional to use first names as a means of address. Thus Goldwater became just Barry uh, to other Hams, and he mostly succeeded uh, in staying away from politics. A 1964 newspaper reported that, quote, for about a year until last July, the senator spent occasional evenings chasing DX or tuning distant signals. Once contact was established, the talk was usually no more controversial than most ham chatter, which tends to center on such matters as how to unjam a stubborn switch. But occasionally the senator let himself get drawn into discussions of taxes, nuclear war, and his chances of being nominated, uh, unquote. But before he became ham famous, most of the folks he chatted with on the air didn't inquire about who he was, and Goldwater would do his best to not make it a big deal. Uh, quote, once in a while, someone will say, Barry, what do you do in Washington? I say, well, I work for the government, unquote. In later years, when his fame was widespread within the amateur radio community, Goldwater was diligent about erasing distinctions between the hobbyists. If a starstruck ham made the mistake of calling him senator or mister on the air, he'd reply firmly, the handle is Barry. Now, in an era when an amateur's call sign had to indicate the physical location where the operation was taking place, Goldwater, like other hams, was allowed to apply for a second call sign to reflect a second home, in this case, Washington. That's the K3UIG one that we see. Um, and during the 1964 campaign, this photo right here uh, was widely circulated, showing Goldwater at the controls of his Washington shack, uh, which featured a, a Collins S-Line radio. He really liked Collins products uh, and a high gain vertical and a beam antenna on the roof. Um, and of course, uh, Goldwater received QSL cards uh, like we see uh, kind of here. So very quickly, this is a case of an UGA, one of his Arizona uh, 
cards from a little bit later. But what's interesting about it is two things. First of all, it shows the four different locations that he might be likely to have encountered somebody while he was on the radio in DC, in Scottsdale, in Newport Beach there, which is where he vacationed in the summer times with his wife, um, and uh, in his car. Um, and what's distinctive about this, this QSL card here is the slash after the call sign. So uh, hams know that especially at that time where your call sign was supposed to say more or less where you were, uh, the slash is how you would say that you were elsewhere. So if he was going to use his K7 call sign in Washington, it would be K7 UGA stroke three. Um, and so in this case, he could be stroke six if he was in Newport Beach uh, or stroke mobile if he was in his uh, automobile uh, or so on. But he spent so much time in Washington, he got a separate call sign just for that one. So he printed up these call signs, these cards here, and then he could fill in uh, after the stroke where he actually had been uh, when he made the particular contact at issue. Okay, so now Goldwater uh, ran for president of the United States in 1964 on a conservative Republican ticket against Lyndon Baines Johnson. The campaign did not go well. <laughs> One insider's later book described the campaign, uh, describing this campaign, the book is titled A Glorious Disaster. <laughs> uh, so Goldwater lost in a landslide. Uh, the later observers credited him for having generated the seeds of a new conservative movement uh, within the Republican party that would bear fruit in later decades. Uh, the Senator's enthusiasm for ham radio quickly became one of the series of personal interests mass mentioned in passing in the national press. One article listed, quote, midnight chats with fellow hams in England, Brazil, and Phoenix, unquote, beside tinkering on cars and nice dinner with, with his family as examples of pastimes. Another reported on his, quote, immense enthusiasm for hobbies and enjoyment, uh, describing the elaborate transmitters uh, owned by the senator. Goldwater brought a radio with him to San Francisco while he was waiting out the contentious GOP nominating convention in July 1964. He was trapped in his hotel room with little to do, uh, so he strung 35 feet of wire out the window and connected up a portable rig uh, looking for hams to chat with. He made 350 contacts, uh, and one of those contacts was the ingenious reporter Carl Bernstein, uh, later of Watergate fame, who got through to the candidate over the air from Washington uh, for a scoop. Um, but radio amateurs were enthusiastic about the prospect of having one of their own in charge. The New York Times reported that, quote, K7 UGA will get the ham vote. An Arizona ham, then newly licensed and in high school related, quote, I recall a lot of us hams being excited about the possibility that a licensed ham might end up in pre as president, unquote. Now, the ARRL was careful with its messaging, quote, partisan politics, such as has no place in amateur radio communications, and even though deep in the heart of every amateur may lie the dream of someday seeing an amateur beam at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, hams should not take sides on the air, nor will QST in print, unquote. But the publication noted there would be significant attention for amateur radio. And so long as hams abide by the non-political tradition, the publicity would be a benefit to the hobby. And I, I should say, if eBay sellers can be trusted, there was even a ham specific uh, campaign bumper sticker, which said KG7 UGA, uh, K7 UGA in 64. And the 64 had a little arrow, which was uh, Goldwater's logo. Uh, but perhaps the most delightful expressions of this enthusiasm were the cartoons published in ham focused 73 magazine before the election. Uh, 73, by the way, means best regards uh, and is a common way of signing off uh, a, a message in amateur radio. A ham in the White House, asked the cover, adorned with a tasteful drawing of the executive mansion, complete with a yard, large Yagi ham antenna on the roof, topped by an American flag, of course. Uh, 11 cartoons followed uh, without mentioning Goldwater by name, not once, uh, and only once by his call. Artist Wayne Pierce, uh, K3SUK, uh, imagined a familiar figure sporting a jutting jaw and heavy glasses, navigating scenarios only a ham would have to contend with. Leaning on a stack of radio equipment, the candidate was asked by the press, would he continue to support Johnson's efforts to lower the White House electricity bill? Um, the candidate fires off last minute instructions to an astronaut about to blast off about how he's going to reach him on different bands when he lands. Um, the uh, other cartoons imagine the effect on the, the government establishment. Uh, you know, two FCC license test examiners uh, crow about the sudden interest in ham radio, uh, bragging that one has flunked three senators, two representatives, and a governor since Monday. Uh, another panel with a cartoon Goldwater uh, at the microphone, as you can see here. Um, one diplomat notes to another that it's nice to know that if the hotline to Moscow goes out of order, there's always 20 meters. 20 meters, of course, being the amateur band uh, that really goes worldwide when conditions are right. Um, and then, of course, there's the matter of a neighbor upset about television interference, common for most hams, uh, except for this time, it's the Russian embassy 
uh, that's making the complaints. Goldwater took time off the campaign trail, actually, in August 1964 uh, to address the AWRL at its 50th anniversary banquet. He clearly enjoyed a break from the campaign trail. He said to the hams, you can't imagine what a relaxation ham radio is for me. With his campaign themes on his mind, Goldwater noted that amateur radio is, quote, a great expression of individualism, unquote, and, quote, selfless, voluntary, private action in emergencies, unquote. The convention in turn honored the senator by passing a formal appreciation resolution of appreciation. Oh yeah, there we go. Sorry, sir, I can't find any FCC ruling on a president being eligible for a two letter call. Are you sure it's all right to call the president old man? In other words, the conventions of ham radio dumb would constrain even a president Barry, uh, much like they had constrained a Senator Barry. Uh, that's why he was just K7UGA. Um, so that gives you a sense, hopefully, of the impact of radio on Barry Goldwater. And so now I'd like to turn it around a little bit and discuss uh, now perhaps a little bit about the, the impact of Goldwater on, on radio. This is the end of the campaign is as good a place as any to, to break up this story. Um, chances are, if a non-ham knows anything specific about Goldwater's radio activities, uh, it's that, he's, that he assembled a team to connect the troops in Vietnam with their families back home over the airwaves. So that's we'll, where we'll turn next. This important and distinctive chapter of Goldwater's relationship with amateur radio was conducted under the auspices of the Military Affiliate Radio Service, or MARS, uh, during the Vietnam era. The name, the actual acronym has changed a couple of times, like the name has changed a couple of times, but the acronym has always been MARS. I think it's something different now. Um, amateur radio had been assist of assistance to the military since the end of World War I, um, you know, but then in the 1920s, it evolved into a, a more formalized relationship with the Army. It was called the Army Amateur Radio System. Um, and then this became uh, Mars in 1948 when the Air Force split off from the Army and each one of their own uh, uh, Mars branch. At first, you had to be a member of the military or like in the National Guard or something like that. Uh, but today, uh, since then and, and today, civilians can uh, can apply and be Mars operators. Um, among other perks, Mars operators use special frequencies for their activities near to the ham bands, but not exactly on the ham bands, um, and had access to military surplus equipment. Goldwater's direct military affiliation dated to World War II and continued afterwards, so it's no surprise that he would turn to Mars shortly after being licensed. In a June 1963 interview, uh, when Goldwater had been licensed for less than a year, uh, he mentioned that he was a Mars operator already and that he had already acquired a phone patch equipment. He noted, quote, I worked a few for the boys. Um, and his, uh, his Air Force Mars call sign was uh, AFA-7 UGA, so similar to his uh, amateur radio call sign. Now, a phone patch uh, was an arrangement using a special piece of equipment that connected the airwaves to the landline telephone network. And this wound up being uh, sort of the most famous part uh, of Mars, although not by any means the only thing that Mars uh, operators did. The radio operator in charge of the phone patch was responsible for managing the radio connection and hooking up the telephone. Um, Mars seized on phone patches as a way that the troops deployed overseas could speak with their loved ones. Uh, the escalation of the American uh, involvement in Vietnam occurred while Goldwater was out of office, right? He, he left, uh, uh, he was up for, would have been up for re-election in 1964 when he was running for president. So he was out of office uh, by this point. Uh, a friend, Herman Middleton, suggested we might do some real good uh, for American troops by setting up a Mars station with phone patch capability. So starting in September 1967, Goldwater borrowed some surplus Air Force equipment and provided some more of his own. And the leaders organized a group of about 30 uh, or so uh, amateur radio volunteers to run the station around the clock, 365 days a year. Uh, this was easier in part because Goldwater's ham shack, which you can see in the background here, uh, was uh, the former, it was in a separate building, it was the former uh, pool uh, pool shack, basically. It contained a kitchen and a couple of bedrooms and bathroom. Uh, the swimming pool was outside, um, and the operators were invited to bring their families occasionally. The volunteer operators handled Morse code message traffic, and they also handled direct phone patches to connect troops with their families. Over time, Goldwater Station made far more than, made more than 300,000 phone patches, becoming the most active stateside Mars operation by far. Uh, troops were allowed one phone patch a month, and they got five minutes uh, once the connection was made. Uh, Goldwater regularly spoke to the troops who he patched through his shack, which he credited for giving him a strong understanding of events on the ground. He also traveled to Vietnam uh, multiple times between 1965 and 1969. Uh, since he didn't return to the Senate in, until early 1969, most of these visits were made under the auspices of his involvement with Mars to help ensure that they had sufficient equipment uh, in Vietnam to make the connections back to the United States. 
He was also an active brigadier general in the Air Force Reserve at this time, so that, that made it a little bit easier. Um, but this shaped his, his understanding of, of the policy pursued by the Johnson administration. So Go Goldwater's Mars operation, uh, you're, here he is in, in Vietnam. You can't see that text very well, unfortunately. Um, Goldwater's Mars operation ended up defining his amateur radio career and making a true ham celebrity out of the senator. A filmed phone patch with Goldwater himself at the controls appeared as part of a 1969 AWRL film promoting the hobby. It was also tremendously good publicity for amateur radio, and Goldwater's efforts, will, while much larger in scale than, and more organized than others, were replicated across America by other hams volunteering. But Goldwater's impact on ham radio was greater than just his Mars program. The first of his legislative accomplishments for amateur radio took place in the early 1960s during his second Senate term before he ran for president. Reciprocal licensing, where some American ham, where American hams would be uh, permitted to operate in other countries, uh, and hams from those countries could operate legally in the United States, was an issue that predated Goldwater's involvement. But he was critical in bringing the measure to a successful conclusion. Uh, the AWRL had been trying since the 1950s, uh, but got uh, relatively nowhere. In August 1961. Uh, they uh, connected with Goldwater. Uh, QST, the ham magazine, referred to him as X6BPI, referring back to his uh, childhood uh, call sign. Um, and uh, AWRL sort of helped them shape some legislation. Um, so it died. This one uh, died, uh, obviously, like a lot of this legislation does. Um, and so he picked up the bill again uh, the following session uh, solo um, with that same kind of enthusiasm that he brought to his restarted uh, ham career. Um, and Goldwater later told amateurs his interest in reciprocal licensing was inspired by a friend in Mexico City who wanted his, to send his son to the U of A uh, in Tucson. Uh, the Mexican ham drove his radio equipped Cadillac and was stopped by border agents at Nogales who wouldn't let him proceed north unless he removed all the radios. If you've ever installed a radio in a car, you know why that's totally unreasonable as a request. Um, the friend later called Barry, he turned around and went home. Uh, he called uh, Barry and introduced, and then Barry uh, introduced the reciprocal licensing bill. And of course, the great irony here is that uh, Mexico never signed a reciprocal operating agreement with the United States. Um, given Goldwater's reputation as a defense hardliner, the prospect of permitting radio equipped foreigners to operate in the United States might seem kind of incongruous. Uh, indeed, the anti communist amateur radio network declared their opposition to the measure as a national security risk and a possible vehicle for Soviet propaganda. Uh, but Goldwater took a pragmatic view. He said, quote, every embassy in Washington has its own radio outfit. If they want to call home, they can. So let the hams come over here and operate. I think it would be a great step in international relations. Another motivation, perhaps the primary one, was that without such an agreement, American hams could not operate in foreign countries without special licensing. And that took a lot of time. This was a big hindrance to DX, for example, uh, people going overseas and, and operating there to, to be able to, uh, to make long distance contacts. As there were far more American hams than any other, country's hams uh, then as now, it made sense that the benefit to American amateurs was also substantial. And the Senate approved. They approved this new Goldwater bill uh, with a few minor amendments on October 16, 1963. Uh, and it passed through the various uh, houses of Congress and it was signed into law on May 28, 1964 by President Lyndon B. B. Johnson. Notably, Goldwater was already a candidate for Johnson's job, uh, although the political attacks on the Senator ratcheted upward uh, after July when he received the formal nomination. Uh, reciprocal licensing ended up taking a few years to unfold as the US Department of State had to negotiate reciprocal agreements with other countries. But even so, just, uh, Goldwater was justifiably proud of his achievement and enjoyed discussing re reciprocal licensing with hands from other countries. Um, as soon as Goldwater uh, came back, that so that's his first major legislative accomplishment. Uh, a second one is, uh, is allowing for amateurs who are citizens of other countries to operate in the United States. As soon as he came back to the Senate in 1969, he renewed his active work on behalf of amateur radio, uh, introducing a bill to permit refugees and immigrants to be able to become licensed. Um, first version of the bill was, was way too broad, so the FCC squelched that, and so he introduced the second version and so on. Um, but eventually, uh, it allowed for anyone who had declared their intent to become a citizen uh, to be able to be licensed uh, by Congress. It was passed and signed into law on August 10, 1971. One Ham Magazine noted, this is indeed good news to many foreign amateurs in our country who are awaiting their citizenship. Remember, citizenship could take a formal process of five years or more. And so if you were a ham in your home country, you come over here, you start the, the citizenship process and you, you couldn't get on the air for, uh, for more than for five years or more. Uh, a grateful ham from Romania wrote to QST calling the news, my greatest joy, as he could now get back on the air while waiting for uh, uh, his paperwork to be a citizen uh, to be processed. 
Um, and then from the mid-1970s, Goldwater took up another ham issue. He tried to push efforts to require the FCC to regulate the susceptibility of radio-oriented equipment to RF interference. So hams had long been blamed for putting the neighbor's TV on the fritz while transmitting. Uh, although amateurs pointed out that the fault was not with the amateurs, it's with the poorly designed circuits in the television. Um, but that rarely got you very far. Um, and so uh, Goldwater introduced a bill uh, in February of 1976, earning an enthusiastic right on Senator Goldwater uh, from the normally uh, kind of buttoned down QST magazine. Uh, this bill got buried, so he tried again in March 1977. And reflecting his increasing seniority and power in the Senate, uh, Goldwater himself chaired a hearing on the proposed bill. The FCC suggested it, it was just then about to get around to, to you know, studying the matter and it would really prefer to avoid legislation. Um, the amateurs, of course, were skeptical uh, of, of that excuse making. The equipment manufacturers were very staunchly opposed, not that they didn't want to do it, of course, uh, but that they thought the free market should decide. Uh, of course, the amateurs were like, well, the free market has had two decades to decide, and manufacturers are seeing that parts worth a dollar or two um, are not being included because they want to save every buck they possibly can, and the TVs are lousy as a result. So in 1979, Goldwater held back on reintroducing this bill again, but he kept up the pressure on the FCC to follow through. Um, and uh, the FCC couldn't persuade the electronics industry to, to finish it on their own. Um, so once this had become apparent, Goldwater moved on from a standalone RFI bill to propose instead a whole package of regulatory reforms to benefit amateur radio. So Goldwater played, uh, quote, played the major role uh, in the passage of a set of major changes to the regulation of amateur radio, which would prove to be his crowning legislative achievement for hams. Goldwater's original bill uh, was introduced in 1981. It endured a series of twists and turns. By the time it was signed, uh, it had been incorporated into two other different bills, uh, and the final, uh, the final product was titled the Communications Technical Amendments Act of 1982, signed into law in September 1982, and it created four major components of the modern amateur regulatory landscape. The first was creating RFI susceptibility standards for non-ham equipment, placing the onus upon manufacturers of consumer electronics to meet minimum standards in rejecting interfering signals. This was the resurrection of the RFI uh, standards fight that Goldwater had been waging since 1976. Um, a second uh, thing, a second important change made by this act was the creation of a regulatory framework for volunteer examiners for amateur radio licenses. Uh, here, Goldwater built on a suggestion uh, made by a California Republican congressman um, who noted that most of the novice exams were given uh, at that time, they were given by amateurs, even though technically speaking, the law didn't allow the FCC to allow the amateurs to do that. And so the, the Californian wanted to kind of clarify that. He wanted to tweak it. And Goldwater said, well, actually, why not save the FCC money by instituting an entire uh, system whereby amateurs test other amateurs? Uh, clearly deriving from a professional uh, ideal um, where they're the ones with the technical knowledge to be able to, to tell, and also it would save the FCC uh, some money. Um, a third major change was that the Goldwater Bill created a structure whereby hams would volunteer to monitor themselves for violations of the FCC's Part 97 rules. As the FCC budget had been cut, it was increasingly unable to fulfill its duty as a regulator of the amateur bands, and Goldwater wanted to permit the ham community's self-policing efforts to assist the FCC to give them a little bit of teeth. Uh, in conjunction with this approach, the bill also explicitly exempted amateurs from the secrecy provisions of the Communications Act, which had been recently inferred in court actions to apply to amateurs, although it had long functioned in practice as though amateurs uh, uh, weren't, uh, didn't apply to that bill. Uh, and then a fourth change was uncontroversial, but important. Uh, instead of the existing five-year amateur license renewal period, the bill permitted a 10-year license length saving paperwork for the FCC and making it more convenient for amateurs. Um, there was also a provision in the original bill, which was later dropped, uh, to require a license to purchase amateur radio equipment, uh, but the equipment manufacturers didn't like that idea. Um, hams in general were ec ecstatic about the bill. Uh, they were especially the protection against RFI problems. One letter to the editor of a, uh, a ham magazine was titled, Thanks, Barry. There you go. Thanks, Barry. Um, now, as far as other legislative efforts, I want to say very briefly that he also proposed some measures that didn't meet with success, uh, but that were important to Hams. In 1985, he tried uh, to set uh, to give the FCC powers to set uh, standards about outdoor antennas, uh, specifically so that 
that local zoning uh, couldn't try and, and prohibit uh, outdoor ham antennas. Um, he personally faced this problem. The, the zoning board in Paradise Valley uh, complained about his two enormous uh, antennas. And uh, by legend, uh, he said something along the lines of, uh, well, they're buried in 35 feet uh, or 35 tons of concrete. And so if you want them out, you can come and get them. Um, he also made periodic efforts to highlight the value of amateur radio to his Senate colleagues uh, outside the context of particularly uh, particular legislative action. So he'd place into the congressional record, for example, a short news piece about Arizona hams assisting hospitals with communication when there was a major telephone system failure, uh, repeating his refrain that amateur radio was not simply a hobby, but ought to be recognized as a service. Goldwater used small efforts like these to help raise the prestige and profile uh, of, the amateur, of amateur radio when he could. But ultimately, by the later part of his senatorial career, hams everywhere recognized K7UGA as one of their own and were grateful to have such a staunch advocate in Congress. He received awards and honors from large organizations such as the ARRL and the Radio Club of America, all the way down through the small ones. Uh, the Fort Myers, Florida Amateur Radio Club made him an honorary member and gave him a trophy. He had no connection to Fort Myers as far as I know. Uh, one ham called him, quote, the politically the nation's highest ranking amateur radio operator. The ARRL uh, dubbed him the senator from amateur radio. Uh, and when Goldwater passed away in 1998, or in the language of amateur radio, became a silent key, uh, the radio press remembered him as ham radio's best friend in Congress and, quote, without peer among amateurs in the public sector. Uh, hams, penned scholar, hams penned heartfelt uh, tributes to Barry and shared anecdotes and remembrances of contacts with K7 UGA. And when the LA Times obituary of Goldwater failed to mention it, a letter to the editor reminded readers that the late senator was also an amateur radio operator, a quote, revealing glimpse, unquote, of another side of the man. So that gives us a sense of, uh, of Goldwater, of the his involvement in amateur radio and of amateur radio's uh, uh, benefit from him. Uh, now I want to move uh, as the third part uh, to talk about the shack itself. I want to turn some some attention to Barry Goldwater's radios here in the museum. What can we tell? What what can these tell us? What can we learn from these? Uh, why should we spend the museum's money to preserve them? Uh, I've got a few thoughts here, and this mostly derives from my work in public history and from public history scholarship. So if anyone wants to talk footnotes, I got them. Um, so I'd say we should start for the record by stating, uh, we should start by stating for the record, I should say, that Goldwater, like many hams, actually had radios in multiple places, not just in the magnificent radio room in his Phoenix home. Uh, he had, uh, obviously, that US Senate office had a big stack of radio gear on the table immediately behind him. Uh, there was an antenna that he put up on top of the US Senate building. Uh, he had a rig in his Washington, DC apartment in a book line study, which we saw earlier. Um, he also operated mobile from his car. His 1963 Corvette Stingray had a SSB radio custom mounted behind the passenger seat um, and a large antenna and coil, um, a remote VFO knob up on the dash, and of course those custom license plates uh, with his call sign. Um, sadly, this car was stolen <laughs> out of the, the parking lot at what became Dulles Airport. Later, he also had a, a radio in his beloved 1969 Javelin AMX sports car, which he nicknamed Spot, uh, similarly with the, the custom license plates. Um, but by far, the most important radio space for Goldwater was his shack at home in, in Paradise Valley, a portion of which is saved in the collections uh, in the museum today. Uh, so here's his home, uh, not long after it was first built. Um, the shack itself was originally built as a separated pool house for the Goldwater's custom home. The home was built in 1957 from sandstone, sandstone uh, quarried from the Navajo reservation. And accordingly, the shack had a restroom, a kitchen, a couple of bathrooms, a significant space. It had a, a, an entrance separate from the main house. It had a great view. Uh, so now with that in mind, the, the shack in this case is, uh, is basically here. Um, so with that in mind, let's look at what we've got in the museum today. Uh, so here is uh, an interior view of the shack, probably uh, I would say in around 1960, seven, maybe 68, something like that. Uh, and he called his shack uh, Bash Hal Na'i, which is uh, Navajo apparently, or at least Goldwater believed it to be the case for metal that talks. He also had a Navajo name for his house and a Navajo name for his plane, a Navajo name for uh, his car and a Navajo nickname for himself. So um, now uh, from a, a, the historian's perspective, Mike Wallace has suggested that technological displays in museums can illustrate the development of an engineering community, 
Uh, and Katrina Herring has noted that ham radio has a distinctive technical culture around which uh, mid-century, uh, which around mid-century placed emphasis on in understanding through experimentation, hands-on learning, building kits, and tinkering. Uh, Goldwater's shack certainly represents this technical culture, uh, but I think it goes even beyond that suggested by Herring. Here we get to see the iterative process of, of that technical culture play out over time. So here's the museum's version uh, of the shack. This is 1967 or thereabouts, uh, and then this is uh, as it's in the museum today. Um, you know, he began to construct his shack in the 60s, we know that, um, and he expanded it dramatically in the late 1960s and early 1970s to accommodate Mars, and then he continued to revise it. Uh, the computer is probably a dead giveaway that we're looking at a version of the sh Senator's shack from the early 1990s, and if you look up the models of those radios, uh, that also suggests sort of late 80s, early 90s kind of, kind of uh, technology. Um, furthermore, there's enough home-built or modified equipment within sight to make it clear that Goldwater was a tinkerer, like most amps. Um, the, this illustration of technical culture not only has its layers of technologies over time, it also has evidence of personal, personalization. So I think that there's a remarkable value here uh, in this display in the museum uh, as an example of technical culture over time. And the people associated with technical cultures like these, less individually famous perhaps, were instrumental in major transformations that took place in Arizona and also in the United States in the second half of the 20th century. So that's one meaning. A second type of meaning uh, held by objects in museums, uh, according to the scholars, is an association with a famous person or event. This association makes the objects numinous, pregnant with meaning, even though those associations are usually invisible. Uh, you might see an old-fashioned top hat in a museum looking like a shabby antique, but when you're told that it was the hat worn by Abraham Lincoln the night he was assassinated, that shabby hat becomes one of America's greatest secular relics. That's in the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. If you haven't had a chance to see it, it's amazing. Um, and so here, Goldwater's shack could be considered numinous in three directions, uh, because of its direct its association with the famous politician, because of its, uh, its association with a demonstrably important person who changed amateur radio, as I think we've, we've established, um, and because of its association with the Mars effort and the Vietnam War. Any one of these might make the shack sufficiently numinous, though the Mars association is diminished somewhat by subsequent renovations. Uh, but altogether, the numinousness of these objects is certainly a valid reason to have them on display. Okay, we could stop there, and I think that we would have made a, an important case, uh, a case for the importance of these items, but I do think we can do even more. One of the most difficult but rewarding challenges of studying material culture in historical perspective is to actually learn something new by looking at objects. In the case of Barry Goldwater's shack, I really think we can do it. Let me explain. If I ask the hams in the audience today what we don't see here, what might be an answer? I mean, obviously we don't see antennas, but we usually don't in, in shacks. Um, we don't see a workbench. A big part of the technical culture of hams is tinkering, soldering, and building things. I bet three quarters of hams or more have a soldering iron within re arm's reach when they're in front of their radios in their home shacks, but not here. Goldwater kept his in a separate place. That's a clue. Uh, what else do we see? We see three chairs. There's a third one off to the, to the right there. Three chairs and room for more. That's also unusual. Normally, the sociability of hams takes place on the air. Typically, only large stations built to work in contests have this many operating positions. And few hams could allocate so much space to themselves without hearing complaints. You know, uh, Another thing we glimpse is all the other stuff. Uh, now, hams have a reputation for filling their shacks to the brim with awards, recognitions, trinkets, and more. Goldwater's stuff we see here includes awards, patches, and strange doodads like this right here, for example. That's an aircraft altimeter, um, although I suppose I should say he was an airplane nut. Um, and apparently he had an altimeter uh, in his car too. <laughs> so maybe that's not so weird. Uh, but seen in a different light, some of this stuff might be aimed at Goldwater himself, allowing him to bask in nostalgia and other things might be intended to instruct. So with these things in mind, what becomes abundantly clear to me is that the shack was an important space for Goldwater, especially the one in his home in Arizona, saved here in the museum. And he used it in his interactions with hams and non-hams alike. He created, probably at least half consciously, a space that was politically disarming, because remember, no politics in the ham shack. Uh, it was warmly domestic. It had this custom furniture. It was in his home, right? Um, it was, uh, but it was domestic without being domesticated, right? It was not actually part of the living quarters. It was uh, not intrusive. It was a ham shack, which ham was then as now uh, a very uh, skewed male, the membership of, of amateur radio operators. Um, it was casual and not stuffy because there's stuff everywhere, right? 
Um, and it was technically un it was technically impressive, both to the uninitiated, un uninitiated, you know, look at all these dials, look at the switches, um, and also to the expert ham to life. He mobilized this space in a service of remarkable displays of generosity toward both insiders, such as his Mars team, um, and hams from all over the world. So if we think of it this way, the shack not only told us who Goldwater was, it was also one of the tools that he used to create and sustain the quote unquote Goldwater that was understood by both hams and also the public at large. It also helps to explain why hams were routinely welcome to take a tour even when Goldwater himself was away. So with those thoughts, I think we'll, we'll finish. While Goldwater's significance to the political history of the United States, I think is not at all in question, I believe an appreciation of his relationship with amateur radio can perhaps better help us, un help us better understand Goldwater's non-political note, not quite private, uh, but non-political persona. And that persona was an essential part of who Goldwater was, and it paid lasting dividends to the, to the hobby of amateur radio. So that's it for me for now. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Eric. That was that was fantastic. Um, uh, so let's um, let's open it up to, to questions. If if anybody in the audience has has questions, please please post it in the chat. And and uh, I, I had a I guess I'll I'll, I'll get things started. Um, uh, I, I guess I had a question as I, as I was listening to you. Um, so would would you say that uh, Goldwater was the most famous ham uh, of his day, or was there somebody else? Was there another celebrity uh, potentially who uh, who also uh, was interested in this hobby? Yeah, you would have put him in the top five for sure. Um, you know, he uh, was certainly the most famous political figure. Um, another very famous political figure was King Hussein of Jordan, or is King Hussein of Jordan, um, who famously, I mean, who gets to talk to kings, right? But hams can do it. Um, you know, and then uh, there were some celebrities of a more traditional sort, uh, uh, God, Godfrey, Charles Godfrey, something like that. Um, you know, in a slightly more recent era, uh, Joe Walsh, the guitarist with the, the Eagles, uh, is a, a ham. Um, so there, there are some folks like that. Um, I think uh, longtime hams could probably trot out a, a dozen or so names, but Goldwater would have very much been uh, at the top. And I think one of the things that made Goldwater unusual was that it was such a part of his persona, um, you know, as opposed to some folks he was on the air a lot. You know, you could, you could talk to him. He wasn't just somebody who held a license. And I think that all too often with celebrities, um, that's the kind of thing that you get is somebody's got maybe they've got a license or whatever, but you know, you don't hear them regularly. But you heard Goldwater very regularly. Great. Looks like we're um, starting to get a few questions in. Uh, the first question is: Is the museum, the shack, and the museum operational at all? And I. I I'm not sure about that. I don't know if, uh, probably not, but. Well, that's one of those things where I know, I, I'll speak for David here. I know that museum people get uh, deeply resistant to plugging stuff in. Um, yes. From an equipment standpoint, some of these radios are new enough uh, that they <laughs> might be, you know, theoretically viable, but I, I would be shocked beyond belief uh, if the museum ever let them get anywhere near a power cord. True, yeah. <laughs> More of a theoretical question, I guess. Yeah. Uh, someone asked about not seeing any Collins. Yeah, so that's a good one. That, that's somebody who knows their, their Goldwater uh, uh, radio stuff. So uh, Goldwater was fairly famous for using radios by Collins. And particularly in the efforts with Mars, uh, there, were a couple, there were some really enormous uh, uh, Collins amps. Um, they ran something like, I want to say 4,000 kilowatts, uh, 4,000 watts, uh, 4 kilowatts. Um, much, much more energy than they would be permitted on the amateur bands. Uh, they were able to use those uh, on the Mars frequencies. Um, and so, uh, so pictures of his shack in that era. Let me see if I've got one uh, in here. Oh, there he is visiting with Boy Scouts. Um, pictures of, of the shack in that era. This is in the early sort of era there. And so these are some of these big amps, but later it's even bigger. Um, show that those Collins radios. And then there were the these sort of smaller, uh, the actual transceivers, uh, the receivers and transmitters um, that were down here at the base of the desk. Um, and those were also uh, Collins. And so if you look at the, the, the shack here in the museum, those have been uh, replaced with more modern equipment. What's in there now is from the uh, late 80s and early 90s. 
Um, and so those radios, I've heard that they're floating around out there. Someone on a net not too long ago said that they had a couple of them. So uh, maybe. All right, great. Uh, yeah, we're getting some more questions in. Uh, so um, this question is, I know that Goldwater was enamored with flying and did so during World War II, uh, but I'm thinking his work with radio would have also been beneficial to the military. Do you know if this ever came up in his military career? Yeah, he was a, a, a huge flying person. Uh, in the Senate, he was known as Mr. Air Power. Um, he leveraged that position to, to get behind the stick of basically any new plane that the, that the military wanted to buy. Uh, he sort of made sure that, that he got a crack at it first. So he even flew like an SR-71, uh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, you know, amazing kind of thing. So in this context uh, with the radio, um, the, the military component of the radio, I think is best encapsulated with Mars. Um, he really sort of uh, raised the profile uh, of Mars, um, and Mars is a is a cooperation between uh, amateur radio operators and the military. They use uh, you know radios that are either amateur radios or like amateur radios, uh, but they use them on special frequencies that are only available to the military to do work of, for example, connecting the the troops uh, with their families back home. Yeah. Great. Um, so someone asks what happened to Senator Goldwater's QSL cards and logs? So that's a good question. There is, uh, there's a, a, a couple of logs in the exhibit. This one right here, when I got down to, if you can see where my arrow is pointing, that's a log uh, from, I want to say 1968, and it's K7 UGA stroke six. So he's on vacation in, in California. Um, but uh, most of the Senator's papers uh, are in an enormous collection at Arizona State University. They've got something like 10, you know, full-size banker's boxes uh, worth of material, maybe more. Um, and uh, that's, when I said that this project wasn't done, it's because I'm going to dive into all that stuff uh, before too long. So uh, yeah, I'm hopeful that, that some of those, bringing some of that, that kind of nuance to looking at some of those sources, you know, being able to see it with the ham's eyes, basically, uh, might give us even some, some greater understanding of of exactly when he was operating, what he was doing, what kind of patterns he had, that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely, that's great. Um, someone asked, is there an antenna at the museum? And no, I don't nope. think we have one. No uh, antennas, no feed lines. Uh, the antennas were sold uh, before this was uh, donated to the museum. Um, the amazing thing is actually that apparently the, uh, the antennas, or at least some of the antennas uh, still exist. He had this glorious, log periodic antenna of this famous uh, Collins 237B3, um, which uh, just is, it looks like a construction crane gantry kind of thing. Um, enormous and, and, and beautiful. Uh, here, I'll show, I'll show you the, the Collins. Uh, where is it? It's that thing, this, that yeah. enormous antenna. Um, and that was uh, sort of a, a military kind of purchase, a very fancy antenna. Um, and uh, that is in private hands. A person in Levine, I think, owns it. Um, and they're trying uh, to restore it. It, it. They tracked it down. It went to a military base uh, after um, the Mars component of, of the Senator's station was assembled in, I want to say, 1983 or thereabouts, early early 1980s. Um, it went to a military base, and then it got sold for surplus, and it ended up in the ha hands of somebody in Florida. And then they found out, and they got it. It's at least back in the Valley, and I think somebody wants to put it up on a big tower again. Uh, amazing. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, someone else asked, do you, does anyone know specifically what rig Barry had in the back seat of his vet? Uh, that was a Swan. I think it was a S200. Um, the, the Swan people are all, all, all over that. He went down, uh, to, uh, what I think was the Swan factory in Oceanside, California to have it installed. Um, in the, the later car, the Javelin, uh, I've seen references to that, but I don't know what rig it was in, was in there. Right. Um, do you think that Barry Goldwater's passion for ham radio influenced the rise of conservative talk radio? That's a really interesting question. I would, I would be inclined to think not. Um, and the reason why is because ham radio is not broadcast. Um, it's more or less point to point. Any ham can listen, but you know it's not broadcast and it's uh, explicitly apolitical. And, and I think anybody who's been on you know, 40 or 80 meters knows that, that sometimes that is observed uh, better than other times. But, you know, the, the spirit is still there. Certainly Goldwater had that spirit uh, very much uh, in mind. And so I think the rise of sort of modern talk radio is, is part of something different. That's, that's sort of, that's media. That's really about media. And amateur radio isn't about media. 
I think it's a really interesting idea. And, and because they both contain radio, like you would imagine that maybe they were fairly close, but I don't think that's true. These are uh, so questions. Much, yeah, that, that, yeah, these are fantastic questions. Yeah, um, this is not a question, someone, but someone pointed out he was awarded ham of the year in 1979. Yeah, uh, I had a whole section in my paper actually about various honors that, that Goldwater got, especially once the, the RFI uh, stuff that, that Big Bill uh, went through in 1982, uh, they started giving him awards left and right. They made a scholarship after him at the AWRL. They, he was ham of the year. He got the Sarnoff award. He got all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, that was a major accomplishment um, yeah. and, and deservedly recognized. Uh, so we have a question. Did other hams frequently operate his station when he was away? Yeah, so certainly Mars is that's that's what the Mars thing was all about. Uh, they staffed that station 24 7 365. Um, and when Goldwater was in town, he would take shifts. Uh, there's, a, for example, a note about uh, him uh, taking a shift on um, on Christmas Eve, I think it was. Um, so he would take shifts, but um, that was very much an operation that depended on those volunteers and they were there all the time. So the Mars station certainly was was operated regularly um, with a station like this it would surprise me if his amateur friends didn't get to operate once in a while, but I don't have evidence for or against it as of yet. Uh, and then, uh, let me see, where did it go? Uh, someone had a comment, the Collins antenna went to the Air Force Reserve Center in Costa Mesa, California for several years and then was surplused. Right, and then from there to Florida, I think, and then to the, the, uh, the fellow uh, here in the Valley who's done it. Uh, so another question, uh, do you know if his stolen Corvette was ever recovered and was the ham radio intact? It was recovered. Unfortunately, the news item uh, didn't say whether the radio was there. <laughs> Too bad. Yeah. Uh, the uh, looks like a comment. The log periodic uh, antenna was extremely important for his Air Force Mars operation. Yep. Exactly right. That's that big column, that big beautiful antenna. See, hams have no trouble saying that big beautiful antenna, and, and my wife is like, that thing looks like a, a, a you know a crane, and it's like, well, yes, that's <laughs> that's the whole point. Uh, but yeah, that one was important in part because it had such a wide range. Log periodics in general have a really wide range of uh, tunable frequencies, and so they could use uh, quite a a, a lot of, uh, of of frequencies in working on Mars. I took a look. It was a, a, I found a source that, that suggested, um, you know, it was statistics from the first year or so of that Mars operation, station operation. I made a few notes here, but they were operating uh, basically between, uh, the hams will appreciate this, sorry to those of you who aren't hams here for just a second, I'm going to geek out. Uh, the frequencies, they were operating between about 20 and 15 meters uh, between the ham allocations there, uh, and then above 15 to almost not quite below 10. Uh, so like the workhorse frequencies, 23.8 megahertz, 16.4 megahertz, 20.8 megahertz. And so to a ham hearing those, those numbers, what you're immediately seeing is that they needed a, an enormous range uh, to be able to, to get the equipment tuned up on, on those things. And obviously the, the tube era functions differently than modern transceivers, but uh, you know, even so that log periodic was, was rightly famous because it was one of the keys to success at that station. Uh, looks like we're running out of questions. A um, couple more comments. Uh, this is Air Force Mars call sign was retired in his honor. Um, and looks like that's a, that's about it. So we're we're a little bit over time. Um, so if there's any last questions, go ahead and get them in. And um, someone asked, how can we get a copy of your paper on Barry Goldwater? Sure. So the paper itself is still under development. So I'm not quite ready to share that. Um, when it is uh, ready to go. Uh, I'm going to look for a, 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 a proper venue. Um, I've already had talks offline with uh, with David, um, but uh, you know there are multiple opportunities, and I'm happy to share this information uh, in in other kinds of ways as, as well. You know, I mean, this is a uh, an important element of ham radio history, and I think that um, all hams benefit from knowing that history a little bit better. So, in that sense, I would actually ask two things. On one hand, I'm happy to share that history uh, as as soon as I can, and and with whatever venues. We, we might want. I think this talk is being recorded, uh, so hopefully uh, the talk itself will be able to be shared uh, if, uh, if folks want to do that. Um, but then I also might ask for those of you who know some of this history, let me know. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm good on QRZ, N7VAZ, 
um, and, uh, and reach out and let me know if you've got histories, you've got items, you've got artifacts, you've got papers and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, assembling this history um, and preserving history, sharing it along to other members of the community is sort of a responsibility of everybody. And I, I stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, I know there are people out there in the community who've probably forgotten more about uh, Goldwater as a ham than, than I have ever known. But, uh, you know, but in my professional capacity, uh, I'm glad that I can do at least a, a little bit to, to help pass these stories along and, and help see them in context. So we have, we have two more questions came in just as we were wrapping up. So let, let, me, let me sneak those in, I, I guess, and then we'll, we'll, we'll call that um, good. So um, did the station remain on, on the air after Goldwater passed away? And if so, for how long? As far as I know, no. Um, so the, the Mars equipment, of course, stopped, uh, the, the Mars operation stopped, I want to say in 1983. So it, 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 he was still in Senate when, when uh, the Mars operation stopped. Um, Goldwater uh, then retired in 1980, early 1987 in Senate. Um, and, uh, and he had a, a, I think it was a stroke, don't quote me on that, um, in 1996. And so he had been at home at that point um, using the station regularly. Um, after that, I don't know that it got used. And then it got uh, donated fairly rapidly, I want to say within about a year uh, after the senator's passing. So um, in that sense, I doubt very much that anybody really used it, and certainly not for any length of time um, after Goldwater. Uh, and then the final question was just about how, how large the, the, uh, the ham radio sh shack is. Um, so I, I wonder if you had any comments about that. Sure, yeah. The piece that's uh, displayed in the museum is, is pretty sizable. I mean, you can see from those chairs, those are pretty standard office chairs, that it's probably about, what, maybe, David, uh, 20 feet long or thereabouts. Um, and of course, one of the things that's so interesting about this is that it did evolve over time. Um, you know, there are these kind of credenza things uh, with all the dials and gauges and so on. And in the earliest photos of his shack, uh, in, in, uh, in his home there, those didn't exist, right? That, this was part of a, a growing strategy to accommodate uh, you know, change over time, uh, change of equipment by and large. But that's one of the reasons why I think that, that this setup in particular is valuable in a museum context uh, because it can help us see that changing technical culture over time. Um, you know, and I think if, if it was just something that he used once in 1967 or, or whatever, it, wouldn't, it would still have the association so it'd be numinous in that sense, but it wouldn't have that sense of time. Um, and that's one of the things that makes this uh, artifact special. And I'm so glad that the museum uh, has it um, and has it on display. I hope that, you know, so this is planned to be up through 2022. Um, and, uh, and I hope that, that it'll be, uh, you know, put back on display uh, down the road in the future as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we hope uh, everyone who's in, a, in attendance tonight can come come by and, and see it at the Arizona History Museum uh, here in Tucson. So, uh, well, we're we're over time. This this was a, such a fantastic presentation. Thank thank you so much um, um, for joining us tonight and uh, sharing your insights. Um, and uh, we look forward to, to working with you with you more. So, great. Well, thank you so much, uh, you know, David, and and thank you very much uh, to everybody who who came out tonight to. Uh, to watch this. I, I really appreciate that to those hams who've been uh, generous in, in sharing information with me. And, um, and so I would say uh, in one ham to another would say 73, uh, which means uh, best wishes and best regards. That's the way we sign off our, uh, our communication. So in that case, uh, 73, everybody. Thank you. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. This program is recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. Uh, hopefully, usually it's about 10 to 14 days, something like that. Um, like David said, the, the ham radio is on display at the Arizona History Museum in Tucson, Arizona.